Yo, 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 Thought Warriors. What is up? Higher Learning is on. It is I, Van Lathan Jr. And it's me, Rachel Lynn Lindsay. Rachel, where are you right now? I am in New York City. She was on The View. <laughs> I was on The View. She Had was a good ho- time. She hosted The View. God damn. Who was on there with you? I, I, I have to say, yeah, I don't have a what? lot of pinch me moments. I do mm-hmm. and I don't, but like 2023 has given me them. You know, we talked about our, our uh, image award. To, I've done The View, but only virtual. So to walk out with the ladies, waving mm-hmm. to the live audience, it was a big deal. So I was on with Joy, mm-hmm. Sarah Behar. Haynes, Joy Behar, Sarah Haynes, Anna Navarro, and Alyssa Farrah Griffin. So, Whoopi and Sunny were out. Why don't they give you the job to be on the View? Well, there's not really a space for me because I'm a liberal, and okay. are you? There are five seats. <laughs> Shut up. There are five seats, yeah. and four of them are already taken by liberals, and then you have Alyssa as the conservative. So, there's not a space for me to be there. What also, I live you? in LA. Also, I live in LA. Let's be clear. If you if they give you a job, we got to do the podcast virtual all the time. If they give you a job to be on the View, you got to move to New York. Why can't you move to New York then? If that's what we're doing. Spotify. Why would I move to New York because you got podcast. a job at the View for the podcast? What's there's, you know what I'm workout, there's work Donnie, out here for you. See if the if the there's roles work. reverse, how toxic would that sound, Donnie? <laughs> Jump on. I think it would. Uh, I don't know. It's a weird analogy because why would Van move to New York? But I was trying to think of what he could be on that's in New York, like The View. And if The Breakfast Club offered you to be like the third member, would you leave? Would I wouldn't take make- that job. No. Interesting. If the, No. Me and him then talked about this. I had my life of waking up at 4.45 in the morning. <laughs> like I, I woke, I, I literally was up at 4.45 in the morning for 10 years in a row. Why? Like, Why would you be up that early for TMZ? In the office at 6 a.m. That was by choice? No. At TMZ, you have to be in the office at 6 a.m. Oh, wow. In the office by 6 a.m. You have to be no. not, not, hey, we get to work at 8. You're in the office at 6. I don't blame you. You do the television show at like 7.15 or 6.45, 6.30, whatever, however it takes... Harvey, like literally, you get in there, fuck around for a little while, and then after that, boom, you go over there, you do the television show. So you're on TV normally by around 6 35, 6 45, oh, at the latest 7 7 15. The latest. That's tough. That's yeah. tough. I, I don't blame you because when people talk about, oh, you know, would you do a morning show? It's like, I have no desire to be up that early in the morning. Like the view comes on at 11. Easter time. I, that is perfect. Here's the deal. I did it when I had to. And it was a part of my work ethic and getting up every single morning and doing that when I had to. I'm not looking to do that again. That's why everybody talking about, oh, I want to be third seat on the breakfast club. Oh, I want to be third seat on the breakfast club. Your whole life changes. Your whole yeah. life changes. Like your whole life changes. You know what I'm saying? But there are other jobs for you in New York. Maybe but I won't take them. I got something to show you. Um, So look, you know what this, so look at this. What do you, what is this, what does this look like to you? Well, it looks like an eye mask. So this is what it is. Do you know what this eye mask came with? I have no idea. They sent this with the pillow thing that I bought on the airplane. (laughs) We're still there with this the inflatable was part of pillow. It. With the inflatable pillow thing. This was part of it. I, I was... Uh, I don't I like the way looking, that looks. I was looking at my... Th- I've tried... To, let me put it on real quick. It's well, not- because most eye masks are just flat. That has indentions and it has like an area for the nose. I don't... You look like the fly. Donnie, hold on. Let's see how- <laughs> I told you. Wait, hold on. Look at this. But I it's not, it doesn't black it out well enough. I can still see through it. Can you? Yeah, like I can see there's light creeping in. I need, when I have blackout stuff, I need 100% blackout. 
I need to to be all the way blacked out so I can sleep. Andrew Huberman talks about that. I don't. I don't like that. You don't wake up in a panic? Because I've done the eye mask before and I wake up panicked. I don't like that. Why are you in your robe? What is this? I'm, 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 first of all, don't I look like a housewife or something like that? This is a very, I I have like a nice setup. I turn on the lights a certain way. Mm -hmm. The bed is made. I'm very, I have been going nonstop all day today. Mm -hmm. I landed at almost one in the morning. Didn't get to my hotel till two. Had to wake up this morning, morning meetings, prep for the show, do the show. I had two interviews for extra. Then I had to get across, get it, get across to town, back to my hotel to do to get ready for this podcast. So it has been a day and all I want to do is be comfortable. So I'm going to do do these interviews in a robe and be unprofessional. I got to prep for tomorrow's show. Mm. Yeah. We got, we got Emmanuel Acho on the show today. Yeah. (laughs) Donnie jump on. Are you excited? Donnie jump on. Yeah. I've been very critical of Emmanuel Acho over the years. Yeah, you have. Yeah. Donnie, have you been critical of him? Uh, <clears throat> not on mic. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure that before, is that me right there? <laughs> you know, this is my favorite thing to do. It's the it looks like you. a tiny bra. Because <laughs> I need you to see how bad this looks. My that favorite thing bad. is to capture you and then show you, be your mirror. And yeah. this eye mask has got to go. It does. That's terrible. <laughs> that's so bad man look that's terrible look at the point of my head um yeah so we have to have a conversation about we have to have a conversation about and with Emmanuel Acho when he comes on the show because I did a lot of research for Emmanuel Acho because I want everything to be nourishing we have we're having some guests on that I've been critical of coming up Emmanuel Acho Stephen A. Smith Stephen A. Smith this Rihanna for no reason. He's going to be on podcast. Uh, his book, Straight Shooter. Hold on. Let's plug his book for him. Stephen A. Smith's book, Straight Shooter. Wait, wait, wait. Why do you have a print? Why do you have a f- copy? Because I went to Mateo yesterday where oh. they had the books. Right. And Chelsea gave All me right. one. Thank All you. Right. All right. Excuse me. Can I, can I do the... I'd like Chelsea this is your, for not sending those out to us. This is your homeboy. <laughs> can, I, can I plug his book? This is Go your ahead. friend, your mentor. He's been he's been everywhere talking about it. Yeah. Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes. Stephen A. Smith looking very stern on the cover of the book. We're going to talk to Stephen A. Smith here pretty soon on Higher Learning. And it's imperative that I keep the same energy. While at the same time, trying to have nourishing conversations with these gentlemen. And in order to, uh, to, to, to have a conversation with Acho today, I went back and watched several episodes of uncomfortable conversations with a black man. Mm-hmm. 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 It's just not my type of shit, dog. It's just, it, I'm, it, it's just not, it's, <laughs> I, um, I want to talk to Acho about it. You know, he's a very successful brother. He's doing what he thinks he needs to do. It's just not my kind of shit. It's just what? not my shit. I think a lot of our conversations should center around uncomfortable conversations. And I think we're well within our right to have an uncomfortable conversation because that's that is that is what catapulted him to another level with certain audiences, because before he was just in the sports world. And I was there at the beginning of uncomfortable Mm -hmm. conversations before it even started. And I don't even know if you know this story. I don't remember if I told it on the podcast when all this started in summer of 2020. But Emmanuel and I can talk about it. But um, I think we're well within our right to get into it. And if you'll remember, when we first talked about this in the podcast, I said, this is, was not for Black people. And I really want Emmanuel to speak to that or to respond to that because Black people weren't messing with it. Yeah. And it seemed like it was never for or about us. You, I mean, look, let's, let's, we'll, we'll talk about it when he comes on the podcast. It's very well said. You were on the show. I'll rewatch that one. It was hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> it was hysterical. I uh, love it. Um, on the other side, this is the big deal of the day. We're going to give you Acho's interview after that. The big deal of the day is Ron DeSantis stopping African-American studies. Dead in his tracks. Really sad stuff. 
Mm -hmm. Other side is break. Okay, uh, Rachel. Yeah. Florida says that AP African American Studies program lacks educational value. Uh, Governor Ron DeSantis has rejected a college board request to approve an African American Studies course uh, in his state on the grounds that the course violates state law. Here's what was happening so everybody knows what's going on. Uh, they are piloting an African American Studies AP class in 60 schools, multidisciplinary uh, course in civil rights, politics, literature, the arts, and even geography. Hmm, that's very interesting. Um, in Florida, they have the Parents' Right and Education Act, which is the Don't Say Gay Act. They don't have the, the 1619 Project in schools in Florida. There is what Ron DeSantis' faction would say, uh, an initiative down in Florida to protect what he believes to be divisive and non-constructive language about the history uh, and and current um, state of American political discourse. He believes that some of the things that are being taught in schools as it regards to black people uh, are divisive, and he believes it to be purposely so. He thinks that there is a woke agenda infecting schools everywhere, and that teaching AP black history in this particular class uh, furthers that agenda. A couple of things that people need to know. Number one, when asked what specifically about this course violates the law, there was no response from Ron DeSantis' office. They wouldn't talk mm -hmm. about it. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, number two, we don't know specifically what is in this course other than broad strokes. There was uh, a social studies teacher named Marlon Williams Clark who said the course is essentially this. How African American studies became a field of study the the strength of early African American uh, early African kingdoms very important the transatlantic slave trade the lives of enslaved people and what they did to resist we're going to come back to that black power black pride civil rights feminism and intersectionality uh, that's basically the broad strokes of what might be in the class we still don't know specifically what it is the governor still said no and mm -hmm. now we are where we are so it should be noted that this would be a high school class. It's, in, it's, a, it's for AP. It's an AP class. It's an so, AP high school. Right. Yes. High school class. Because I, I feel like I was even getting, when I was first reading, I was like, what? They banned this this in college? They banned it in high school. Not that it makes it even better. Also, you have to know that DeSantis, DeSatan, as he's known in some circles, signed um, legislation called the Stop Woke Act, yeah. which stands for Stop Wrongs to Our Kids and Employees. And this act, prohibits any instruction that could make someone feel personally responsible feel personal personal responsibility for historic wrongdoings because of their race, sex, or national origin. Okay? That was challenged very recently in the last few days a federal judge said that Florida was well within its right to have this act. So this so they were are saying no AP uh, courses on African American studies based under, they're saying it violates the Stop Woke Act. I found a little bit more stuff about what this, because it should be known that this isn't just, hey, we want to do a class on AP African studies. This class was cultivated. This class was, there were several people um, with experience of college faculty and teachers across the country. Henry they, Louis Gates. Yeah, they drew on their expertise to design yeah. this for high school students and um, uh, to teach them African-American studies. And they further said that it's an interdisciplinary course that reaches into a variety of fields. It's where African-American studies intersects with literature, the arts, humanities, political science, geography, and science. Uh, to explore the contributions and experiences of African Americans. This sounds like an excellent class. And then I thought, huh, so you want to stop an AP class on African American studies. I'm very curious as to what other AP courses are offered in the state of Florida under some of these public high schools. AP Chinese Language and Culture. AP French language and culture, AP German language, language and culture, Italian language and culture, Japanese language and culture, Spanish language and culture, AP European history, AP United States history, mm. 
AP World History. You have all that culture, all this worldwide history, but the one you want to stop is one that is based on African Americans. This looks like culture erasure to me all over again, because this isn't the first time that we've seen cultural erasure in our country. When we were brought here, they forced us to adopt Western culture, and they tried to completely erase us from what connected us to Africa. You know, it's it's in recent years that we've really started, I mean, the last few decades, you know, that really started to connect back to our home, Africa, and take pride in that. They tried to take that away from us. That's exactly what they're doing right now in our history book and in our studies. No other culture except for African-American studies. So that's very key because there are a couple of reasons within there that make this act by DeSantis so particularly pernicious. All right, Mm -hmm. number one. The African studies movement comes around 1967, 1968, in the late 60s. It is to have an AP course on African American studies is incredibly important because it's a more rigorous examination of the black experience in America. And there is a certain amount of, uh, of importance. There's a certain amount of prestige that goes along with having an AP course about a certain subject, right? This would have been the first time that you could gain college credit for this. So this, in a lot of ways, is a validation of a decades-long movement to study the, the legacy of Black people here in America and worldwide. So that's one thing. Like, this says, piloting this course and having this course in schools says that the topic is important. It makes the topic important, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's important uh, just for to elevate the minds, thoughts and voices that have been championing this for a long time, like uh, Henry Louis Gates. Okay, so that's important. And number two. Some things in here that are being taught when I see them teaching the lives of enslaved people and what they did to resist. That's very important to me. That strikes right at the heart of who we are as a people. Think about the moment that a lot of people remember me for. Mm -hmm. Kanye West says slavery was a choice. Mm -hmm. There are all of these people. It's 400 years. Sounds like a choice to me. It's all of y'all here and you didn't do anything. That's essentially what he was saying. That's what he was Mm -hmm. uh, insinuating by saying 400 years and nobody did anything. Well, If you were educated on the lives of enslaved people, if you were educated in the ways in which they resisted enslavement, in the ways in which they rebelled, you'd know that that's not true. That in and of itself assigns strength to their human condition and what they thought about their lives. The narrative of Black people, um, as talked about in movies like Django and all around the world, is that we're docile, easy, easy to control, and by nature, servile. It's untrue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The truth is, we're survivors and incredibly hard to kill. So because of that situation, the people that our ancestors that went through these incredible hardships, these disgusting, unthinkable um, human tragedies, were people that survived those things so that we could live today. And talking about the ways in which they survived lends to me uh, the same honor, the same credibility, and the same reverence to their lives as you would other people who died so that America could live. Other people that who, that died so that America could become what it is. So there's a, a dignity in learning and understanding Mm -hmm. the black and African-American experience that it seems like the de facto leader of the Republican party doesn't want black people or America to have every single other class you went, you read off AP studies in language and culture that doesn't threaten the very fabric and understanding of American society, like black people being able to access and discuss intimately who they are and where they come from would affect American society today. Mm. 
I <laughs> I hope that this is challenged. I don't, I, I mean, well, let me ask this. Can it be, right? If there's, if this is found legal under the Stop Woke Act, then I don't know if there's a way that high school students or any student from K through 12 is ever going to have the opportunity to learn about African-American studies or slavery or how we got here, our history. We're not going to be connected to anything because you're not allowed to have something that makes someone feel because they think they feel personally responsible when we talk about our journey of how we came from Africa here. That makes mm-hmm. you feel guilty. Well, in Florida, that place that that they'll never get to a place where they'll be able to teach that, to learn that, to understand that, which is why I'll go back to talking about erasure. We're getting erased from history. And Florida has an act that says that that's a that's legal to do. So this is a dub. This is this this one is lost. And let me tell you what I mean. A by dub that. for them. Um, yes. Yeah. No, no, no. This is a, it's a dub for the class. The class is done. Like the ball's in his court. The fe- the federal judge ruled and said that you know, it, it, this is a dub, okay. But let me let me tell you how I look at this. All right, so we're not being erased. They're stopping us from writing. They already erase us. <laughs> okay, like, huh. uh, okay, they already erase us. They're stopping us from writing. This is the beginning of the book. <laughs> in a lot of ways, they're stopping us from writing. Um, there have been other sort of milestones. In the study of African Americans, their lineage and their history, the Norton Anthology of African American Literature came out in 1997. There was African American National Biography. All of these things are wins for African American studies. This was the going to be a huge win uh, to further, um, I don't want to say legitimize, but that's kind of what it is, or to to add further value to the study and understanding of Black people in their American condition. This is the only way to fight this. In my opinion, um, because even if this pilot program is accepted in Florida schools, mm-hmm. I have thoughts that it's not going to look anything like what it would have looked like. Oh, no. Because having a milk toast version of it, having a vanilla version of it is worse than having it at all. OK, right. you, it, it, it's right. It's not even that things aren't being taught is that. Typically, they're the wrong things that are being taught. So mm-hmm. what you need are the people who know about this, Dr. Gates and all of the other people from the Hutchins Insti- from the Hutchins Center for African American Studies. They need to be allowed to make the curriculum here or it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. So if, if they go back and say, hey, we've looked at this, we don't think it's, and now we get a version of it that's, that's mutated, that's not good either. Okay. This has to be remembered because we're going to be in an election pretty soon. We were, in, we were in one back in 2018 where Ron DeSantis was up for a gubernatorial election. He very narrowly won. He very narrowly won that election over a black man. Um, and this is what you get. This is what you've gotten. What you've gotten is the don't say gay bill. What you've gotten is migrants being shipped throughout the, the dead of night to different places. And what you've gotten is the literal spitting in the face of black progress in terms of the way we are discussed uh, and talked about in schools. Literally rolling back yeah. across progress. Yeah. What's going to happen is a guy like this, he does all of these things, he gets a primary win. And then once he gets a primary win, now he's in a general election. And then in the general election, a guy like this very covertly tries to roll back who he was to appeal to a wider audience. Yeah. He does it very subtly. And people start thinking, oh, well, if he does this for the economy or if he lowers my taxes or if he... Ron DeSantis and his wing of the Republican Party, they aren't a threat to your bottom line. They aren't a threat. They're a threat to the very existence and identity of who you are and who you want to be. The Republican Party, as led by guys like him and Trump, are an existential threat. An existential threat to the future of America and the freedom Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. black people. This is this is this is literally book burning educational 
Orwellian yeah. mind control bullshit. Like in all kinds of ways. And so, you know, like the South made its, I, I'm from the South and I love the South. The South long ago made the decision that they would rather be racist than be fed. The, the South, in a lot of ways, this is all history you guys can look up, chose starvation over black liberation because there were all types of policies that would have would have really helped the southern part of the United States economically and socially. But if it meant that niggas got a piece of it, mm-hmm. them motherfuckers would rather starve. Mm-hmm. And this is going to hurt Florida. I heard Jelani Cobb say that there are going to be all types of educational professionals who don't want to be a part of the school system in Florida I at hope, both I, the hi, I, I high school so. and college level because of this. And it's going to cause a brain drain in Florida. They don't give a fuck as long as you don't know who the fuck you are. Yeah. It's really remarkable. And let's be honest, too. Florida is just the start. It's what happens. They watch what happens in a state. They watch what works, these other red states, and they're going to emulate this. It's not yeah. going to just stay in Florida. And that's Great the point. problem, too. Texas is probably coming with the nigger bill oh, next. Oh, you know how Greg Abbott rolls? The nigger bill. N-I-G-G-E-R. Now it's going to get even, even racist? Wait, no, even? no, 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 no. Now it's going to get even realer. The nigger bill. <laughs> <laughs> nigger. This is what... No, now it's going to get extra racist. I like the, that. But they would, yeah, now it's going to get extra racist. The nigger bill. Yeah, that, the nigger <laughs> bill. They're going to come up with some crazy bill while you can't fucking say Martin Luther King Jr.'s name in school. All right. We're going to we're gonna stay on top of this story with DeSantis. And we're going to make sure that there aren't any things that we can do in order to, to make sure that this... Uh, isn't the last word here in Florida, but you guys all need to know this. That man, Ron DeSantis, is going to run for president. Mm-hmm. And when he runs for president, it's going to happen to me. I'm going to be disenchanted with the Democrats. I'm going to be all this, and I'm going to forget what the fuck the stakes are. And it's moments like this that are good for me to remember. We'll remind you. We'll keep okay. you in check. It's just sad. You know, I want to like a fuck okay <laughs> all right <laughs> on the uh, other side of this Emmanuel Acho all right higher learning family we have a special guest in the building best-selling author host of uncomfortable conversations with the black man illogical is the book and it is out on paperback when Emmanuel it is out here shortly in about two weeks from today so out uh at the end of January out at the end of January, one of the co-hosts uh, of Speak for Yourself on FS1. Speak now, man. Things have changed. Speak now. Oh, excuse me. Now Joy going to be so mad. Now Joy will be, be, so be, so be so mad Joy will be so mad at me. Speak. It, is, it is not Speak for Yourself. Okay. Speak. 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 Emmanuel Acho joins us today on Higher Learning. Emmanuel, what's up, bro? What's up, man? Van, I ain't seen you in a hot minute. Been a uh, long time. Rachel, I seen you, I don't know, maybe last week, but um, it's good to see my people, man. Let, let me let me let me jump into this real quick, real quick. Uh, before I even get to anything, Marcellus Wiley made some comments uh, on his podcast about Rachel. You didn't see this. I just want to no. make sure Marcellus Wiley made some comments on his podcast. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. He said that <laughs> on his podcast, he talked about all the beefs that he had with his various co-hosts over the years. And you were in that list of people. He said that you were angling for your own show and you did not tell him that you were angling for your own show. Basically, Sal said that you did him dirty. Your response, <laughs> did you hear it? Did you see it? What did you think? Have you and him talked? Of course I saw it, bro. It's funny you said you want to give me an opportunity to respond. Man, you know it's 2023. <laughs> if you want to respond, you got all the opportunities you need. Um, It's funny. I mean... I don't know, Cell threw that into like a a beef post, but that wasn't even beef. It was really just his interpretation of um, his exit. You know what I'm saying? Like it was was his interpretation of his exit. Cell and I don't even have beef. I saw Cell maybe four weeks ago, five weeks ago. Um, What's interesting about people, and I think in all honesty, what I respect about Marcellus Wiley is he will shoot straight 
and he will say things that are offensive, but he won't ever be offended. Yeah. And that's what I've just learned about, uh, about him. And I respect about him. It's like, he, he said that. And so many people hit me up. was like, yo, you know, you, 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 you snaked him out of a job. Da, 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 da. I was like, with all due respect, I showed up at 29 years old and had a marginal NFL career. I don't have the power to, 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 to snake somebody. I'm a tw- I was 29 years old at the time. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So like, I don't have the power nor the ability to, um, to do what was suggested. Uh, but no, honestly, I mean, I, I love what he's doing now. And, and Cell is one of the greatest co-hosts I've ever worked with. So respect to him. Mm. Wait, so he uh, didn't leave on his own? It depends who you ask, right? I mean, I think he did leave on his own because he okay. had the opportunity, in my mind, to stay in some capacity. But I don't, you know, there's your truth, there's his truth, and there's the truth. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I don't really know, man. This media stuff is crazier than sports. Is it? Yes, it is. Cause, cause it, yes, it is. Because it, it <laughs> seems like in that situation, there would just be like one thing that happened and that people would like be able to kind of say what it is. But because when, when it happened at the time, it was like sales going to do something else. You've got a new show with Shady and Joy. It seemed like crazy, everybody though, was happy. I never I would yeah, I hit sell throughout it all. And I was like, yo, just keep me updated. Like, what's your move? What's your move? What you thinking this? What you thinking that? So I didn't know sell wasn't for sure coming back until mm-hmm. I saw him announce he wasn't for sure coming back. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I knew he I knew we were going to be restructured. I knew he was probably going to get his own thing at the network. I was going to get my own thing at the network. But I did not know sell wasn't coming back until I saw he wasn't coming back. And I was like, right. still don't ever lose though. That's the thing. I mean, highest paid charger yeah. in NFL history, mm-hmm. um, made it on television by 35. So I knew regardless of what Sell's going to do, he's not going to take a L. Yeah. Um, so look, Uncomfortable Conversations with Black Men. Okay. Your show, the show that kind of catapulted you to the next level. I've watched it. I got to be real with you. Everyone that's listening to this is just reality. I've been very, very critical of different Emmanuel Acho situations over the years. You have. You yeah, have. I've, for sure. And I went back to watch the show and, and, and try to research more and get a deeper understanding of, of what the, the aim of the show was before you came on the, uh, the, the podcast. And I have to admit, like, I just cannot fuck with it in any way. It's it 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 it, 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 it almost feels, bro. Like I watch it and I'm it. The show angers me. Have you ever had anybody else that ha- that's had that reaction to it? Of course, of course. I mean, if if you want to avoid criticism, say nothing, do nothing, be nothing. Mm-hmm. So if I wanted to avoid criticism, I would have to live my life inside my house and keep my mouth shut. So no doubt about it, man. I've, I've had that all oh, here at all the time. More often than not, I hear positive feedback. I recall mm-hmm. Akbar Bajabi Emil is someone I greatly respect. I'm sure you all have crossed paths with him at some point in time. You know, like, hey, thank you for saying what I did not have the words to say. Mm-hmm. But truth be honest, truth be told, bro, like the show wasn't for you. And I think I've had to realize, like, yo, the show wasn't for everybody. Um, the, the show, you, you're educated. And you're more than educated on what it takes to be a Black man, because you are, in fact, a Black man. You have lived in America as a Black man. You know exactly what that looks like, feels like, sounds like, particularly based on generations. show wasn't for you. Hmm. I, the show was for people who have no idea what it might be like to walk in a black man and or woman's shoes. Show wasn't for Rachel. Rachel's my dog. Rachel's my sis. I've known Rachel for since I was in high school, truth be told, because I used to run track meets in my old high school. Show wasn't for her. Um, And that's no slight. It's just to say that I created this show with the intention of enlightening people's eyes who had their eyes closed. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Rach? We talked about it on this podcast before. And I remember, this was like, man, when we first started. And I remember I even told you, Emmanuel, I was like, listen, I said, this this Black people don't get it. They don't understand it necessarily. It's not necessarily for us. And I told you that we talked about that on this very podcast. From what I have heard when it comes to criticism about uncomfortable conversations is that Black people 
<clears throat> feel like you are too accommodating to white people in your conversation. How would you respond to that? You catch more bees with honey than vinegar. That's how I would respond to that. But, do, but so, is honey <sighs> what is necessary? I think is the thing. Because in 2020, okay. we were in a completely different mindset and we were outraged. And so mm -hmm. I think the response was negative because from black people, because they didn't want, they didn't feel like you should be do handling it with kid gloves or with honey. And it seemed more accommodating to them that you were giving them too much space rather than telling them certain no, things that we I were going through. I respect that. I think, like we all say, black people aren't a monolith. So you have my dog, Toby and Wigwe, hip hop artist. That's my dog, Nigerian. Oh, and he going to say, say a song, try Jesus, don't try me because I throw hands. He going to say, arrest the killers of Breonna Taylor. Um, he's going to sing X, Y, and Z. You have Amanda Seals. And Amanda Seals going, yeah, she going to come at you. Mm -hmm. Incredibly educated. Uh, she going to come at you. You have Sean King. He's going to say what he's going to say. You got Ibram X. Kendi. He's going to deliver the information incredibly didactically broken down. And um, you have my approach. And I'm not going to rap about arresting the killers of Breonna Taylor. And Toby's probably not going to sit in an all white room, you know, saying, dear white brothers and sisters. But I'm also not going to undermine what Toby or Amanda or anybody else is going to do. And I would hope they would not undermine me. Like there's mm -hmm. different types of everything in this world. You got different water bottle flavors. You got different types of TVs. You got flat screens. You got plasmas. It's all good. So what I am more often than not frustrated by is like, bro, you don't have to like it. Sis, you don't have to like it. Not literally y'all, but the proverbial bro and sis I'm sure. speaking to is like, Bro, it's all love. Like, I don't necessarily agree with what so many of these other people are doing. I'm like, you know, what, what, what's that doing? How's that moving the needle? But I know mm -hmm. people don't agree with me, but what I'm not going to do is publicly undermine them. Because then, now it looks like we fighting against each other, which is what people want to want to see from us in the first place. It's black people fighting black people. Go ahead, man. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. What When you said your method, what is your method? My method is this. Um... I believe that if you really want to understand something, you have to immerse yourself in a culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up Nigerian American. What that means is I have the privilege of knowing where my parents came from. I go back to my village in Nigeria. Okay. I'm tracked with me because I'm going somewhere with it. Um, but I went to a private school, majority white in Dallas, but sure. then I went to church in the hood. Rachel can attest to that. Rachel, I think y'all went to Concord. I went to Oak Cliff Bible right Fellowship. Right down the street. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. So, I grew up with black people. I grew up with Nigerian people. I grew up with white people. As yeah. a result, I know when white people say, well, racism doesn't exist. I know why they say that. Because I've been in them rooms when they're saying that. Mm -hmm. When I kick it with black people and they're like, all white people are racist. Hmm, I know why you're saying that. All the while, I have the privilege and luxury of not having generational trauma because my parents were born in Nigeria. So, man, my method is removing some of the sting um, because I don't have that sting and trying to deliver a message in a manner that people can receive it, primarily white people. Okay. Let me tell you why what you just said offends me. Okay. All right. First of all, there are a couple of things. I grew up South Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, all my classmates were white. I was in the gifted program. All of my classmates were white from the beginning. McKinley High School, gifted program, McKinley High, 80% black school, gifted program, all white, vans in the class with them, vans in the class, vans playing basketball and sports and everything else with the black kids. Mama from South Baton Rouge, all of that. I understand the being pulled between two worlds. I understand the having the insight into two worlds. You saying that you don't have generational trauma and you didn't mean it this way, but the reason, and, and it's, I have to name it. You saying that you don't have any generational trauma in some way meaning or that in some way meaning that your delivery method to white people is going to be either more effective or more sanitized is to me dangerous. And let me tell you why. Everybody that you just named and what you're talking about does what they do in different ways. I don't think that any of the things that they do are necessarily harmful. But what I could say 
is a black man, a prominent one, acting as an emotional butler for white people and serving them the most milk toast, unspicy, unseasoned brand of racial discourse and accountability possible could definitely be harmful because of what it does. I saw it, I saw episodes where you were on there with Matthew McConaughey and Matthew McConaughey out and out said, when will Black Lives Matter end? He goes, well, when is it going to be time for it to be over? But that's an outrageous question to ask at the time that he's sitting down with you. And it's an, it's an outrageous question to posit when we're going to be able to say all lives matter after everyone just watched George Floyd get his head blown off. I watched you also sit down with the police. Did you in say the, my response? In, in, the, in the conversation with the police that I watched you have, there was nothing tangible that addressed the systemic issues of policing that lead to unfair and deadly outcomes all over the country. It was about whether or not the police liked back black people, whether or not they were nice to black people. And even as I wrote it down, the police are human too. Emmanuel, who gives a fuck? Like we're fighting for our lives. And to me, having a conversation like that at that particular time, it's not that it's a different method. Everybody has a different method. Is that it's the wrong method. Is that it gives cover for a lot of the issues that you're supposed to be discussing. Roger Goodell's on the show. I watched the whole interview with Roger Goodell. Roger Goodell is talking about Colin Kaepernick in the past tense. Colin Kaepernick right now is fighting to get back in the NFL. If the NFL cared about Colin Kaepernick or what was going on in his life, Roger Goodell could be an agent of change now. You get the opportunity to talk to him and the fact that he's speaking about a man like that in the past tense is just simply never broached. And I'm and when I'm watching it, I know that you have the best of intentions. You're a good guy. My question is, what the fuck is the point of all of this? Is it to make them feel better about all of these things that are going on? Like, for what? Like, why? Like, why would you, why are you talking to someone and there's zero call to action? It's just, now I'm going to go be a better person. It just don't work that way. Is this rhetorical or is it actually a question to be answered? That's you can answer it however you feel the need to. The, the, the what what you like what I what I said was what you said was everybody does it different way. What right. I said was the way that you do it to me is no way at all. That's fair. Um, I think that's subjective. It's subject to your uh, interpretation. It's subject to your opinion, which I respect. Um, I will say this: anybody watching and listening, I encourage them to also go watch any episode that you referenced um, because some things were out of context. I would also encourage anybody watching and or listening to understand that uh, Matthew McConaughey asking a question is not an indictment of my response, nor did you submit my response. I would What'd also, you say? Uh, dude, it was two and some change years ago, so I would have to go back and- I can tell you what you said. And, would you like me to tell you what you said? Uh, if you have the direct quote written down, yes, but I wouldn't want you to paraphrase. Okay, what, what, what you said was not right now. You said oh. right now, right now it has to be about Black Lives Matter. All right. Well, okay. then I, I would I would feel as though um, that answer would suffice to someone asking when will that end? Not right now, because right now it is about Black Lives Matter as it pertains to the cops. Um, well, I, I also think it would be a a a waste of our time for me to try to address every issue you or anyone had with every episode. I think. At least it would be a waste of my time. I can't speak to your time. I honor your time. Um, what I can say is this. Dude, it's, 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 subject to, it's subject to people's opinion, man. Like, if people wanted me to be harsher with commissioner of the NFL, Roger Goodell, I get it. But I went in there with one specific question to be asked. What would it take for Colin Kaepernick to be back into the league? Everybody and their mama had been posting about it, tweeting about it, shade rooming about it. But at the end of the day, nobody sat down with the man. Like, he wouldn't sit, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't sit down with them, but he would sit down with you, which makes and your so, conversation even more important than that. Absolutely right. And so when I sat down with Roger him, Roger Dale's free son, to come on Higher Learning, and I have a, a litany of questions to ask him. But he's not going to talk to me. He's going to talk to you. Well, I would ask you to ask yourself, why is that? Because you don't <laughs> threaten him. Because oh. because 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 the re the reason why he will the reason why he'll talk to you 
is because he's going to come out on the other side of the conversation looking better. The reason why he wouldn't talk to me is because I'm going to come out on the other side of the conversation needing answers. Before we get to this, Brian Flores sued the NFL for, 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 discrimin for, for discrimination. On Speak for Yourself with Marcellus Wiley, you brought up the fact that Brian Flores didn't have any black people that worked for one of the law firms that he used to represent um, to represent uh, himself in the lawsuit. Why was it necessary for you to poke holes in Brian Flores at that point? Great question. Great question. Uh, because my thought process is this. Brian Flores, if you are going to sue the National Football League, and clearly for those listening, watching all the things, I, I apologize for jumping all around. Usually I am much more of a streamlined speaker. Um, if Brian Flores is going to sue the National Football League for a lack of representation, then I would hope that his team representing him would have representation. Now, what people don't realize, because as you, Van, thankfully have, have suggested, the law firm reached out to me and said, hey, we do have representation in X, Y, and Z place, but if you can, do you have any other resumes, et cetera, of black people for us to look at and consider? I then take that information. I reach out to my homeboy who's a lawyer and say, hey, can I help present black people to this law firm? So I think a lot of people think I do things for show. I'm telling you about this first time I've ever told anybody about this because it's actually irrelevant. Like the good I'm trying to do in the world, I don't really like need a, a pat on the back for. But that law firm, which had no black people, then ends up hitting me up and I end up setting them resumes of black people to try to help promote black education and all these things. Uncomfortable conversations. I came out my own pocket with that. I rented a studio space in Austin, Texas. I hired a wedding videographer. Each episode cost me ten to fifteen thousand dollars by myself until I could get partnership because my objective was always to promote good in the world, even if it cost me financially. And what people don't realize, I didn't have money like that back then. So that was my reason for the Brian Flores piece is optically, I want us to be above reproach and I want us to be without being able to be attacked. And at the moment in which I saw that, wait, the team representing you isn't even white. Let me bring that to attention. That team reached out to me. And all of a sudden, now I'm sending them rather maze. Last thing I'll Man. say about that. Oh, go ahead, Rachel. Go ahead. No, no, no. Because I'm, ahead, I'm still a Last thing no, I'll no, say about that. Thought. Last thing I'll say about that is I'm proud of, I'm happy for all of the, uh, the um, I'm proud and happy for anyone who got a job because of whatever uh, went on with Brian Flores and the law firm and your relationship with them. The problem is, is that when you're looking for that clip, do you know what you get? You get 15, 20, 30 clips of alt-right sports commenters disseminating information about how Brian, Brian Flores is full of shit and what he's talking about and his fight and lawsuit with the NFL because you're pointing out the incredibly insignificant hypocrisy of the fact that his legal team didn't have any black people on. I disagree that it's incredibly when, when 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 his when his when his fight is with the NFL, right? When his fight is with the NFL, you are literally looking down the bench of what he is talking about and you're saying, "Yeah, sure, but what do you have going on as far as your law firm is concerned?" And everyone that you everyone that's talking about that you're giving cover for them to say that what he's talking about is bullshit and that it's less important because he's a hypocrite. And I'm not, when I say this, this is not conjecture. I'm watching people going, wow, finally, somebody calling out the woke media on Brian Flores that has absolutely nothing to do with what Brian Flores was talking about, dealing with, complaining about, or seeking financial retribution from, from the NFL. Zero percent. It's a completely other issue. If you want to have a complete, if you want to have a different conversation about how we are being represented, when if, you, if your manager is black, if your lawyer is black, if your accountant is black, but in his fight against the league, one thing has nothing to do with the other. And to my earlier point, what it did was give cover to people who are acting in bad faith. And that's a power that you're wielding sometimes that I don't think that you see. The lawyers that, that all got jobs because I'm happy for them, but there is a gigantic fight with guys who represent the industry that you played in that are getting kicked in their ass by the NFL 
And to me, the Brian Flores thing took a chunk out of their ass. Am I wrong about that? Um, you read some things online that I didn't read. Um, I, I, I can say this, that I have spoken at nauseum about the discrepancy between the lack of NFL ownership being minority and coaches. I have spoken at nauseum about the fact that the Rooney rule, what it has done for the NFL and um, its lack of significance going forward. I do have a question, though. What's your intention of this conversation? Uh, to keep the same energy that I ke- that I keep with you when I'm not on the um when you're not on the podcast, we're gonna have you on the podcast. There's no way I can be as critical of you, uh, when you're not on the podcast and 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 not say these things. To be honest with you, I think you're a good guy. Like obviously, uh, honestly, I think you're a good guy. I think the, I, I think you're stepping out in the world in the way that you know how. And I think that I'm doing it too. And I think that I fuck up all the time. And that I make mistakes all the time. And I think that we all do. But I just. I can't be a bitch like that. Like I'm on your ass a lot because a lot of the stuff that I see is like it, it, especially during that time, it was nuts. It was crazy. And when we had the conversation on the phone that we had on the phone, it started off in a place where it was very adversarial, where you called me over something that you had said on Twitter and that I made fun of. And then at the end, we understood each other. And I think that I understand you, but I cannot not bring up some of the things. I haven't had the chance to talk to you. So that's why this is happening. I feel like um, it's kind of a waste of my time. Like, if you want to have this conversation, you just call me. Like, I don't, I I just don't realize, I don't, I don't know what, what the takeaway of this conversation is. Cause as it seems now, it seems as though you've come with a ton of receipts. I do not have the time, nor have I put in the bandwidth to refute um, anything that you said, nor am I really that confrontational. So I'm not even really going to challenge all of the things that you said. You've quoted an episode from Matthew McConaughey from June 7th, 2020, uh, from officers from November of 2020, a Brian Flores quote from an old show that I used to do without also supplying the listener and or viewer with all of the positive I've done about um, Brian Flores, that situation, Bruce Arians, that situation, Mike Tomlin, that situation, all of the positive I've done. So... I just kind of feel like y'all hit me with the okie doke in regards. What's the okie doke? The no, okey-doke Emmanuel. Let me say this. No, 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 Emmanuel. Let me say this because I I don't like being accused of you know like bringing you on under any kind of false pretenses. You know, you and Van have had outside conversations. You and I have had outside conversations. You know that things haven't always been, you know, great when we're referencing things that you've said before. We've talked about things you've said multiple times when it comes to Shakari, when it comes to Calvin Ridley. We've talked about that on this podcast. Lamar and the Jackson. Reason why, and, I don't, and I don't want you to think that, that anybody's trying to trick you on this, but I think it's relevant to what this podcast is about. Our podcast, Higher Learning, is about Black culture and how certain things intersect with it. And you do things that are about Black culture. So I think it's fair to have a conversation, even if you and Van are on totally different sides of it, it's fair to bring that to this podcast because that's what we do. So it's not about not recognizing great things that you've done. It's about just having a conversation about certain things. So I don't want you to feel that way. Look, I, I, um, I am confident enough in who I am and what I've accomplished I'm just kind of like, this isn't a conversation. This is Van chastising me and me responding to being chastised. I don't, I can take it. Now, with all honesty, I just got off a two hour show. So like, I'd rather not utilize my time doing this, but I can, Rachel, you know, I love you always will. Um, I can, but I'm just like, I, I just don't, I don't know. I want this to be productive. I'm looking for. How would it be? How how would it be productive to you? Because what I, what I think, so this is what I think. I think. And I'll do this. I'll apologize if you feel attacked. No, no, well, no, bro. I don't need. I don't need an apology. I truly you just don't. And I don't believe in sorry. You, you, you just threatened to walk off the show. No, um, I, I literally. Just, my publicist. Whoa, whoa. Pause. My publicist says, "Let me know if you want to rap." I said, "No, leave me on." Okay. Okay. Last so, 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 well, I'm not. Me, well, I'm not going anywhere. So, so, so. This is the honest feeling that I have, and I've been, and I do the talks. I've talked with Jason Whitlock. I've had to talk to brothers in the Nation of Islam, had pro-gun guys. Like, this is kind of what I do. It's no problem. I think that your, that your brand of what it is that you do 
is, is, is harmful. And I would be lying if I did not say that. I think that. I think that it's harmful. I think sometimes that what I do is harmful. I have all kinds of ways that I am fraudulent, that I am inconsistent, that we're people, right? The reason why I have it, examples of this is because I researched for the interview, actually hoping to be like, yo, I have this guy all wrong. There are a lot of things that I disagree with. What I want to what I want to understand is from you is like for someone that looks at things like me, for someone who thinks that we have sort of made way too many beds for white America. We've given them way too many soft beds, way too many pillows. The last thing they need is another cozy blanket. Like, do you not see that someone that's trying to build something, uh, that's challenging to America and challenging to the status quo and challenging to the idea that all that a white person could wake up in the morning and be like, oh my God, uh, like I I have all of these internalized sort of issues inside of my brain and now I can go out and post something on Instagram. It's all good. Like we don't need, we need people who understand that co-conspirators and allies mean getting your hands dirty. And sometimes I think the way that we talk about these things, we have to be very intentional. Um, and so for me, that's that's the thing. It's not it's not anything personal. It's like when you said the javelin thing and we talked, I'm like, dog, I don't have no problem with you. But that statement was wild. I I vehemently disagree, vehemently disagree that what I am doing is harmful. Um, mm-hmm. I I can I can meet you in that what I am doing is um, not as contentious as people might like. I can agree that what I'm doing is not as aggressive as people that might like. I can agree that what I am doing um, might be too kind for what people might like. But no, honestly, like, it's just how I grew up. (laughs) So I am going to fight the way I know how. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, like, I don't curse. I don't have an issue with people cursing. I just don't curse. So if people want me to, like, curse, I just don't. I like, I, I, I use my words. I just like, I don't, I don't have that natural predisposition of aggression. I have a natural predisposition of peace. So I am going to fight the way I know how. Now, for those that want to be more aggressive, by all means, I'm not going to knock it. I'm just fascinated by people who knock me because I'm like, bruh, you fighting your fight the way you know how. I'm fighting my fight the way I know how. Now, why do I uh, disagree that what I'm doing is harmful? Because I do not think, in my opinion, based upon my experience, and I believe that your experience is your expertise, I do not think that a white person is leaving a conversation with me more ignorant, more uneducated, um, or more in the dark than they were before. I don't think that in my experience, and I have a litany of emails to to prove so. But at the end of the day, I understand that there are are different approaches and Mm. I respect other people's approach. I believe some approaches are harmful, but I respect everybody's approach. What what Uh, do you think, which which approach do you think is harmful? Curious. I believe the approach that is excessively, emphasis in the operative word there being excessively, I believe the approach that is excessively aggressive is harmful. Reason being is, if you are trying to get someone to learn a message, um, whether it's educational, whether it's in sports, whether it's relational, whatever the case may be, and you, you approach it with too much aggression, they'll never even be able to hear the message because of how the message is wrapped. So if the message is wrapped too aggressively, they'll never, it, it won't even make it to the front door. And so while it's well intended, it just won't even make it to the front door. We talk about um, the, the, the conversation with Roger Goodell. I don't think I did any damage in that conversation. I couldn't get him to answer the question straight up. And I tried. Hmm. Boy, did I try. I edited it, the, the episode so people don't see how many times I asked. But I couldn't get him to answer the question straight up. Um, but I think that is more productive than hopping on Twitter and being like, Roger Goodell is the reason Colin Kaepernick's not in the football, National Football League, because that's just not true. Um, so yeah, man, I think that that's what it is. I I respect y'all stance. 
I respect that everybody don't like me. And I, and you know, the hard part, Van, is like, I've had to come to terms with that, especially people that don't even know me. When I first called you, I'm like, bro, I don't even know, dude. And he coming at my neck. I'm like, I don't even, I yeah. had to call Rachel to be like, hey, let me just call him. Cause like, I thought it was love, but I guess it's not. It was, it, you said that we couldn't have Olympic athletes smoking marijuana because somebody was going to get high and throw a javelin and stab somebody in the heart. My G. That's hyperbole, bro. <laughs> what, what did you say? What did the tweet say? What did the tweet say, Emmanuel? Tell said, the people what the tweet it said. Was, it was, Emmanuel, it was, Emmanuel, it Emmanuel. Not to what the heart, did the tweet say? But, you, but, what, but like, it was the javelin. What did the tweet say? Yo, hold on for a second. Hold on for a second. Hold on for a second. That's fucking hysterical. Like, I don't care, bro. That's that's what you, so what you fucking said was funny. hyperbole though. What you what, just uh, said was hyperbole. Uh, what, what did, okay, what did you what did you say? You said that the javelin was gonna do what? What was the javelin gonna do? Um, I, I said I projected the question of it's okay if somebody's running wall high in a straight line, but what happens if they're throwing the javelin? I never mentioned anything about stabbing somebody okay, in the fine, heart. Fine, that's that's but funny. they'd be okay. reckless with the javelin. Yes, okay. he exaggerated so, the end. And, and you know what you and you and you know what you said to me when we were on the phone? You said that you've never smoked weed before. Correct. So you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And so that to me, and, and, and so like, and so to me, I, I, I didn't come, I didn't come at you personally there. I just said, yo, this is really funny because only someone that had never smoked weed before would say something like that. And we talked about it when, when you got on the phone, we discussed it and I was like, boom. And I think that there are other people who I know who also talked about it as well. This is the part of it that like, I'm just going to say, I understand what you're saying. There's no way. The reason why I think sometimes things like that can be harmful, and I'm definitely not saying that I'm the right guy to deliver any messages to anyone at all. When the cops leave, when you're sitting down with the, the police officers, the police officers leave, you have an opportunity with the police officers to actually get through to them and discuss what's at the center of the and the heart of the actual problem, right? I think something that is harmful is people thinking they have the answer or people thinking that they have an, uh, an, an, an uh, a hold on an issue when they actually don't. Because that sends them off into the world willy-nilly. All the, all the emails that you've gotten and all the stuff that you've gotten and all the, the the things that people have taught, I'm sure they feel amazing about themselves. And I feel, I'm sure they feel amazing about the world. But to me, like, aggression, we're talking about power and safety. There is no way to be safe if you are not powerful. Like, zero. If you get in a fight with somebody as big as what you are and with the athletic pedigree that you have, right? And they want to hurt you and you want to hurt them, but they are five foot one, 110 pounds. You can ex you can extend to that person altruism and say, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to let you slide. But you're taking care of them. Like for me as a black man, I'm not asking for white Americans to have more information so that they can take better care of me. I'm not asking that for that. What I'm what I'm yeah, letting what, what, what I'm what I'm what I'm letting people know is if things do not happen the way that we need them to happen, we will Fuck this situation up, period. And when I say fuck this situation up, I don't mean going out into the, the world and, and, and necessarily doing violence. I mean unity, group operations, collective banking, pooling all resources, doing things that affect the bottom line and the socioeconomic structures in America in a way that makes white people uncomfortable that makes them uncomfortable because everything that we're, that, that George Floyd was the last straw and nothing changed, bro. The police killed more people last year than they ever have. Three guys here at the beginning of this year, all of the other shit, it doesn't work. And, and, and it's somebody's, got to, look, I don't want to, I'm really in, in, in no way trying to, uh, trying to offend you. Like, no, you're like, not. You're not. Uh, you're not. I, I, I deal with this, but significantly worse um, every day on social media. Um, but you, one of the words you said there was unity. You said unity. And that, mm -hmm. that stuck with me. But this is the most ununited conversation 
that I've had publicly with another black person. Because when you all drop this episode, nobody's going to leave this conversation thinking like, wow, that was phenomenal dialogue between those two brothers and that sister. No, they're going to leave thinking, man, this dude, Acho, whack as hell. I knew it. No, they won't. It's going to be mad people that are going to be pissed off at me. What? Yeah, they will be. What? Sorry. Well, well, they well. well, they're going to be mad people, dog. I'm, I'm, it's going to be both. Man, there's, it's, there's no like, this This isn't like a united conversation. Well, let me so, then let me ask you this question. I want to ask you this question. And I, and I was always going to ask you this question. And I'm not asking you this based on anything that you just said. I think that we can all both agree, Van and I, that you have good intentions in what you started. Obviously, I was there at the start with you. I, I, I was there at the start. So I know where your headspace was when you wanted to start uncomfortable conversations. You I know my that. First ne- call. Never doubt, never doubted you on that. And it, I think, and I told you when you went to do it by yourself, I was like, it's got to be you. And we talked about why it wouldn't work with the two of us. Like we talked, we talked about that. But this is what I want to say. And, and I and I think this is a good way to wrap up this conversation. It's almost two and a half years, or it is two and a half years since you started Uncomfortable Conversations. No, three. What are we? Two and a half. Two and a half years since you've done Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. Where do you think we are now since when you started that, I believe it was June, when you started that in June 2020, how do you think we are now as a society since you started it? And specifically with some of the topics that you address in those conversations. We talked about police. Van just brought up a statistic about police. Where do you think we are in coming, because we talk about unity. Where do you think we are? Are we in a better place? We, when you say we, you're talking about us in totality, you're talking about black people, you're talking about black and white people. I'm talking about black and white people because that's the, po- that the point of the, of the whole series. Um, I would say that people are more enlightened that a problem does exist, but they ha- we haven't yet gotten to fixing the problem. I think prior to the murder of George Floyd, I think the lights were off. I don't even think people knew, like, when I say people, I don't think the majority of, like, my white brothers and white sisters realized, like, oh, there's really a problem here. I think they were just going about their merry way. Systemic racism doesn't exist. Oppression doesn't exist. Like, even after Donald Trump, they had no clue. They didn't know anything about that. I wouldn't say, I, yeah, I didn't care. I think the person who speaks in absolutes is an absolute liar. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't say they had no clue, but I would say, yeah. like, they were less illuminated. Then I think after the murder of George Floyd and since then, now there is more of an awareness to there is a problem. I think a lot of things are for optics, but some things are for outcomes. Rachel, you and I have both been a part of of things that have been done for optical reasons. On television, there are things that are done for optical reasons. Um, With different brands or things that are done for optical reasons. But I do think that some people and some companies also care about outcomes and not just optics. So yeah, I mean, where where are we? I think now we are more enlightened. But I, I also said, and I ended my book with racism and racial equality, rather. It's not a finish line you cross. It's a road you travel. So we're not going to get to a point and be like, we did it, guys. We solved racism. It's just not going to happen. But I do think we can travel the road. Fair enough. I will say this. Um, we can't solve racism. We can't. But we can set a price for it. That's all I'm asking for. All I'm asking, the only thing I'm, I I don't care about allies. I don't care about any of that stuff. I'm asking for a price. The thing that was the most powerful about the Me Too movement was that women took their power back and they said, hey, if you treat us in a certain way in society, we will take everything from you and there will be stakes. And in order to kind of set those stakes, you have to be, in my opinion, aggressive about what it means to transgress and to put the safety, the evolution, and the existence of black people in danger. And that is what I'm asking white people from. I'm asking for them to keep their toes behind the line so that we can all get on together. You ain't got to like me. And I don't need to understand you. I just need there to be rules. That's it. By the way, this was an uncomfortable conversation. Uncomfortable for me, comfortable for Rachel, uncomfortable for you. And it does. it's not just uncomfortable conversations with black men that white people have to have. Sometimes two black men of two black men and a black woman, a black woman and two black men, they also have to have uncomfortable conversations. As a matter of fact, I think sometimes that might be more important. That was Emmanuel Acho. This is Higher Learning. The book is illogical. The show is Speak. Joy is going to be super, super pissed off at me. Um, Emmanuel Acho on Twitter, everywhere, on Fox. Appreciate your time.
That was Emmanuel Acho. Ah, uh, first of all, you guys know me by now. And you guys know what happens when I get go. So, um, <laughs> I do want to say that I did not anticipate. Uh, maybe I went too hard. I don't, I want to say this publicly right now. I do not think that Emmanuel Acho is a bad dude. And you said that before. I don't think he's a bad dude. I think he's a good person. And he is probably a much more moral, aligned, uh, honorable person than me in many ways. Yeah, look, man... I don't know if it's my anxiety disorder. I don't know. This shit pisses me off. Like I, like we did it. We did the show, Rachel. And I'm, I apologize to you, Rachel, too, for sucking up all the oxygen in that interview. And I know the gentleman is your friend. So like, uh, um, I, like I've been in a deep, 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 funk over some of the statistics that we talked about in the last episode. Mm -hmm. The fact that the police killed more people last year, the fact that this is still happening, like, yeah, y'all don't just get fucked up over shit like this. Like y'all don't like all of that shit was for nothing. Think about, think about where we were, man. Like think about being out on the street, not knowing whether or not the virus was going to fucking kill you. Not knowing like you taking chances out there. I saw women out there crying. I saw people and like we right back in the same place and it's the same shit and we bullshitting when we get out. I'm like, it's not even it's not his fault. I, I'm I'm sorry. He is right. I am angry for so many reasons. I'm mad and I, and I need to be a better person in so many ways. There's so many ways I need to be a better person. So many ways I need to be more of an ally to black women. I need to be more of an ally to, I need to be, but this shit, I'm, this, I'm, I'm mad. I can't fucking, I, I can't fucking wrap my mind around this shit. I can't fucking deal with this shit. I just can't, well, I'm just. It's what people feared when the Black Lives Matter movement took off after George Floyd, when people were outraged, enraged, when people were posting black squares, the fear was we'd get to a point where all of it would die down and things would go back to the way, the way that they were. Not only has that happened, it's gotten worse. And it's even magnified, or I guess it's even multiplied is what I should say, because as Emmanuel said, when I said, well, where do you think we are now two and a half years later? He said that people are enlightened. So people are enlightened and it's gotten worse. What does that say about the society that we live in? That makes you angry. And so I understand all of that. And I think, and, and I hate Emmanuel walked away from this, what I felt like not getting it. Y'all have two completely different approaches. You handle this situation totally different. You are on opposite ends of the spectrum. And I truly believe he knew that coming into this. But at the end of the day, you're not knocking him for trying or his intentions. You're saying that you don't agree with it and you feel in ways that it's harmful. Doesn't mean that he's doing it in a bad way. It's just harmful. Um, I actually hate that the conversation ended like that because I think that this could have been a really productive conversation. And I think that maybe on both ends, you got in your feelings. And so it became more, the topic switched and it became more of the wrong thing than it should have been about Black people having it, disagreeing about our approach and how we fix something that has been on us since we have existed in this society. So I hate that the conversation turned that way. You know what I mean? So let me tell you like what happened, seriously. And... Um, it probably was a little unfair to him. But let me tell you what happened. It's just, like, I'm walking around and I'm listening to kind of like what's going on. You know, I'm walking around, I'm really doing research. Uh, I, Rachel, I called you today. Mm -hmm. 
I called you today. I called you today and I said, and I called you because I wasn't sure. I, I called you. I said, hey, I know that this is a friend of yours. I'm like, this is not going to go well. well. I said to you, I said, this, this is going to be a hard interview for me. Like, this is going to be a, like a tough one. Uh, because as nobody is completely pure. Like, I work here for a corporation. I don't work for a black company. He doesn't work for a black company. You don't work for a black company. I don't have a black company. I do have a black company. Shout out to Six Feet Over Productions. Nobody is pure. Nobody is beyond reproach. I worked at TMZ for nine years. And like working at TMZ and being around there, it's just another, when you talk about having to exist in white spaces and talk to them, like that's not, there's no like metal for that. Like everybody does that. Like every black person that I know does that. Has every to single immerse one. themselves in white culture. Every, yes. Like we work out here. Everybody does that. So I'm sitting down and I'm listening to it. I'm thinking about the time frame in which some of these things are happening. And I'm thinking about some of the stuff that's going on. And I'm like, yo, can we afford to like continue to make them feel like it's okay? Like just wake up and understand what's going on. It's just going to be okay. No. Stop fucking with us. Like for real, or it's gonna be some shit in the most po- in in the most polite way, in the most polite way. Well, Matthew McConaughey. Well, when will when will Black Lives Matter? When will it stop being about Black Lives Matter? When they stop killing Black people? Answer to question. Like for right now, it has no. When they stop killing Black people, like a whole conversation about policing, no qualified immunity, no discussion of of of, of training techniques, no. Uh, like no, none of that. Like none of that. And so he's right about something. I don't feel better after the conversation. I don't. It did feel, um, I don't know. I don't feel, uh, (laughs) I don't feel better after the conversation, but only because it took a turn. I, I just felt like what I wanted what I wanted to have is you're right you keep the same energy we've discussed things that Emmanuel has said before on this podcast and I thought that this was going to be an opportunity for you to express some of the things me to express some of those things us talk about it I knew that I would probably be a little bit of a mediator in between because I fall in between the middle of you guys I didn't expect for it to be what is the intention because I to me the intention is clear we don't agree. I think things that you've done have been think the way that I wouldn't do them. And let's discuss it. And you talk about why you've done those things. And I'm going to talk about how my side. And we could agree to disagree. That's where I thought this conversation was going to go. It got personal. That's why I don't feel good about the oh, conversation. I don't, think it got, I don't think it got personal. You think it got it personal? Get per- no, no, no. People took it personal. So maybe oh, I should say it that it way. Oh, he took it personally. Took yeah. it personal. And I think that we, I never thought we would agree, but I thought it could be a way for you people to see different sides of the same conversation. That's what is what I thought was going to happen. And it got a little too serious. Hmm. Mailbag. Mailbag time. Time to read your letters and then we'll reply to them. Oh, it's mailbag time. Write us with your queries and we'll chime in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, first one is from Princess Tiff84. They ask, what habit are you most proud of breaking? And what habit are you most proud of starting? I don't know. <laughs> Look, you guys, we tried to give you mail back. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> like we, like, uh, we tried to give you mail back. We're we're keyed up over here. We're, uh, uh, I, 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 what I, 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 I t- you know, it's, it's, it's. Last thing I'll say. It's it seems so insurmountable. 
it just it seems so hopeless sometimes and and um and i'm not doing any i'm not like all right man he said that the conversation was a waste of his time he's right he's right i feel like culturally we don't have very much time to waste you do not have to go out and crack a crack a crack on white people to death. You don't. That's not what I'm trying to do. That's not what I do do. But the era of taking shit and holding people's hands down the land to the Rainbow Bridge is over. Every time you grab white America's hand and you walk with them hand in hand to the promised land. They kill you on the way. That, that's not hyperbole. That's just true. And I, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's no one person's fault. It's not fucking Matthew McConaughey's fault. It's not Roger Goodell's fault. But it's somebody's fault. Hmm. And if... If if we're going to take the time to on all of these different platforms and all of these different microphones and all of these different shows to, to keep skipping rope the same way, it's just, and look, <laughs> I watched, I, I spent a whole day watching the whole shit and I got mad. I lost it. I'll, I'll take a Xanax and I'll, I'll like, I'll like, I'll calm down. I just want to know like what, like what we doing out here. Like, why would we make, why would they need to feel better? Like, why would they need to feel, why would they, none of those conversations are uncomfortable. They be kicking it. They no, be kick, you know what's they be, crazy? They probably were. And that's what's even more sad. They probably were uncomfortable. And that's not, even worse. Not my finest moment. I'll be the first one to admit it. I accept everything that comes with it. I am who I am. Rachel, I apologize. Donnie, Ashley, I apologize. Uh, um, Should we end oh. on a lighter note? Let's end on a, Rachel, on a positive note. Let's end on a positive note. Let's end. Let's end, let's end on a positive note. Okay. Because we don't want to... Hold on. We don't want to make it... Uh, we started off on a positive. We're going to end on a positive. So you might have seen us advertise this on social media. We've talked about it here on the podcast, but it's actually happening. So we told y'all about the movie, You People. That movie comes out next week on Netflix. And we are going to do a screening. And we are going to do that screening in person next Friday, January 27th. So what's going to happen is all the Thought Warriors, we're going to get together. We're going to watch the film. And we're going to have a conversation. Not an uncomfortable conversation, but we're going to have a conversation <laughs> okay. immediately right. following the movie. Uh, space is extremely, extremely limited. So we're going to let you know right now how you can hurry up and reserve your spot. I know you. some of you guys have already been hitting me up on social um, wanting to know how you can come. So you need to head to our pinned tweet for the registration link at Higher Learning on Twitter or the description, or you can find it in the description on Instagram at Higher Learning. It's going to be in downtown LA. Okay. Hopefully you guys can make it out. It's going to be at 4 p.m. Full details and instructions will be sent to all the confirmed guests. I'm also going to post the registration link on my social as well. So we hope to see you guys there next Friday. We will have a different energy, but we will be <laughs> ready to discuss you people. So you guys come ready. All right. Uh, I'll tell you, think yourself, but do not stop learning. I am Van Lathan Jr. I'm Rachel and Lindsay. Bye, guys. <laughs>